um, this afternoon we have our webinar, Late Season Irrigation Management, brought to you by Cotton Info, CSD and CSIRO. My name's Janelle Montgomery and I'm the Water Use Efficiency Tech Specialist with Cotton Info. I'll start by introducing our presenters today, Dr um, Mike Banch, Senior Principal Research Scientist with CSIRO, and James Quinn, the Marketing Extension Lead with CSD here in um, Narrabri. We'll be having an update of where crops are at now and what we'll be monitoring. We'll be examining um, cutout and discuss um, irrigation management after cutout and finish with timing of final irrigation. So with no further ado, I'm just going to hand over to James Quinn and Mike Banch. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Janelle. Um, well, I'll just quickly give a, a, a brief update of where the crop is up to across all the districts at, at present. Um, we could probably sum up this uh, season um, with a fairly good sporting analogy. It's been a, a season of two halves in, in the fact that we've had a, you know, two distinct phases so far. We've had the first couple of months of growth being extremely cold, um, struggled to get things to, to move, um, and then you know, in this last um, month or so, things have actually started to really kick on, and we are, we're seeing some some crops really respond to a bit of, bit of warmth and a, and a bit of water as well. So um, some of those early crops too planted in central Queensland. Um, are going to be harvested extremely soon, um, so that will be very interesting to see how, how they go um, and how, how they fare th this coming season. I suppose that this season, though, we, we have seen um, quite a, a, something that we haven't seen previously, and that's a lot of tipping out um, early on. Really, this is something we haven't seen pretty much since um, 1998 in terms of um, that. Um, that was um, tipworm back then, but it looks like it's uh, mirrors and the sucking pest now. But you know, once the Bulgard three um, era came across, or the Ingard Bulgard era, we haven't really seen this sort of tipping out um, that we, we used to see years and years ago. But you know, and that slowed crops up. Um, basically, you know, people were not really sure exactly how they were going to respond to the level of tipping out and we also saw with that sucking pest you know fairly low retentions early on and that that has delayed the crop a little bit further um, not only just with the, with the temperatures and that but you know we should be able to make up for that in the, this period now so you know up until about that December time very very cool conditions slow growth a um, lot of insect pressure basically you know everything was against us as soon as we, we turned the corner and got a little bit of warm weather into it and irrigation started to, to come along, the crops really responded really, really well. Basically, it's put on a lot of fruit later on in, in, in its cycle. This season, we're going to see a very late predominant fruit set in the, in the crop this coming se season, and it's going to have some implications that we'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, and, you know, it, they're really starting to, to, to power along now and, you know, Continue good, clear days, some warm weather, and and you know the, the availability of water is definitely going to push these crops along. Yeah, James, it was just it's, it's interesting that uh, the season of two halves is really really is quite played out. That in the sense that um, one of the things that we were concerned about with the cold temperatures was the the size of the plants leading up to flowering and the stresses that were occurring, and certainly one of the challenges and the things that we're seeing at the moment is actually um, because we're packing on so much fruit so quickly because of the warm temperatures, we're seeing we are starting to be really challenged by trying to maintain growth and uh, to to keep the nodes above white flower high for long enough before, uh, and not rocketing towards a, a premature cutout. I suppose that that's a nice cue for me to probably talk a little bit about what what cutout. Um, oh, a nice cue about what we need to talk about in terms of how we should be looking at the crops. Um, around this time of the season. So just before you get into the, the whole cutout process there, Michael, I'll just I'll take a step back. And, you know, these, these are the sort of things we're looking at. Obviously soil moisture, um, you know, that, that's going to be top of everyone's mind at the moment and trying to make sure that irrigation scheduling across the whole um, farm is done on time, um, you know, especially in, in some of these hotter, hotter weather. It's obviously going to test a few systems out. Nutrients is an interesting one and we don't want to set these crops up for you know to, for excess growth. We want to make sure that we, we are feeding what what's going to be there in, in that regard. And we also need to remind ourselves that the fruit set is going to be to be late. And you know, Mike made the comment there about you know prematurely cutting out. We're going to make sure we, we try and drive those crops as hard as we possibly can in this little period now to um, maximise our yield potential as, as much as we possibly can. Insects. We've mentioned a lot about early season insects, but you know I, I think there's the sleeping giant of the silk leaf whitefly is out there. 
Um, you know, and that ties into a little bit about the, the nutrition story. We don't really want to get these huge crops that we have trouble getting chemical into to kind of control that. So, you know, watching that it, um, this season is, is going to be a very critical thing, and that, and that plays on into the foliation as well. But also, I've also had a few things. People starting to see mites um, this season that we haven't seen for for a lot of years as well. So that, that might be something that people need to look out for um, as we move into the, the last third of the season. Obviously, crop growth, nodes by white flower. Uh, Michael talk a little bit more about that and the vegetative growth rate. We want to try and make sure that we are getting row closure, getting a getting a factory that is actually going to support the the development of the bowls. You know, we we spoke earlier on about how we were struggling at first flower to try and actually get a a plant size that we we would like. Now, you know, we're we're finally getting the, the thing to grow, and it's just a matter of working out we don't want it to grow too much. And obviously, bowl numbers retention. You know, they're, they're the they're the things that we, we want to be looking at to make sure that we are on track to physically deliver a fairly good good yield. So, you know, in this period now, you know, we always say that January is a fairly important month for the for the crop. It's a make or break month. You know, we can have up to 90% of that yield set um, between that flowering and cutout period. So we're going to move on and talk a little bit about um, what what cutout is. And, and what it what it means for the cr the crop physiologically and, and from a management perspective. So, in a, in a general sense, uh, the, the the definition of cutout from a physiological point of view is essentially when we have a, a cessation of the production of new fruiting sites or, or squares, and and this comes about um, in in a cotton crop when we basically our demand for resources um, from the fruit equals the supply that we've actually been providing through the, the growth of leaves and stems and, and, and access to water and nutrients. So fundamentally the plants are actually programmed in a way to cut out um, and they, they when they do cut out and they reach this point they've actually in, in their own way of thinking or evolution have actually decided they now have enough resources, access to both water and nutrition to actually uh, fill that crop out. So that they're actually sensing and understanding that maybe the environment they've got going forward um, has access to adequate water and nutrition. Or in the case of dry land, they're basically saying this is the water that I have under the crop that I, I have to actually uh, mature and grow that fruit. We use we use cutout um, as a, as a mechanism. Um, we try to time cutout and use cutout as a mechanism to actually manage our crop, given it is it uh, it's an indeterminate crop and. Uh, you know, if we were, uh, theoretically, we could actually um, feed these cotton crops um, continuous amounts of water and nutrition, and if we have adequate temperature, they would grow for, for a very long time. So what we want to do is time and manage cutout so we have an adequate time that the, the, the last flower that we produce, a cutout, has adequate time to mature, ready for harvest. And that's why we call it, we either use the word, either refer to it as cutout, or we try to time cutout when there's the last effective flower. So this has important implications in terms of ongoing management. But look, we'll have a look at the graph next. This sort of shows in terms of the fruit development. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, it's quite timely that we're doing this uh, this uh, um, web webcast this week because I had no voice last week. So I'll see how I go. Um, we've actually you see the pattern of fruit development, and consistently we we. Um, we see that you know flowers, um, squares chug along, and um, you can see the dark line being the, the squares. And when we get to cut out, um, we see that the squares cease developing, and and no more fruiting sites, and the flowers continue continue to grow, and the bowl load increases. The important thing is why do we? And this this graph is quite old, not in, in 1984, and it's actually um, we've done recent research to actually understand, you know, what 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 cutout is physiologically, and there's plenty of evidence to suggest that this this, um, this research back that where Greg Constable and Brian Hearn did in 1984 is, is relevant today in terms of physiology. Uh, one of the examples I was often used is that we, we go and apply cutout rates of picks, and when we, we're applying cutout rates of picks when there's already um, nose above white flower four or five, um, we see no impacts on growth. So reducing the vegetative growth or ceasing the vegetative growth at that point in time doesn't actually impact on yield because the the, square, the, the leaf area, the water and nutrients are already there to actually deliver the yield. Um, was there a question there, James? No, no, no. no. Okay. So, um, 
So let, we'll move on to the slide and we'll talk a little bit about the implications of stress during these different phases of, of growth. So this is some stuff that Steve Yates um, did a, a number of years ago, or not in 2010, and really he was looking at the high retention crops, which we, we're terming, you know, the Bulgard sort of era crops in, in terms of having that high retention. Obviously, this season we didn't have as much high retention, um, but the pattern is exactly the same, and actually, you know, it fo will follow the same thing here. So, you know, really early on in the season, water stress, not going to be too much of an issue, the peak flowering and late flowering. Um, where we are now is the time when we don't really want to be stressing the crops. So this, this is a fairly important time for us right now, um, especially when you're taking the heat. You're also taking the fact that we've got a, a very late set bowl load that you know, we don't want to be trying to stress the, the crops as possibly now. The time to actually stress the crop, or if we do need to stress the crop, is it, you know, an optimum time to stress the crop is actually at that bowl mat maturation stage at that um, 14 days post cutout sort of situation. So we're not, not now, but we're looking at that uh, February time, mid-February sort of scenario there. So, you know, and that uh, and that's what we can utilise some things around um, the soil water availability and actually the, the permanent wilting point of the of the of the soil to, to you know push those crops or push that irrigation cycle um, or that last irrigation. We'll talk about that in, in a second, but push that irrigation or that last irrigation to make sure that we don't have um, a stress in that crop at all. Thing and you know that, that lays on to um, things around compaction um, and you know utilising late season rainfall if we actually do get it. I suppose one comment I do want to make, and especially around this one here, is that you know we don't keep them all in terms of the fruit development. It is important that we do have the sites, and you know they are taking care of themselves. But the, the total number of of flowers that we do produce don't actually all turn into bowls, um, and it's just a matter of trying to manage that stress because the, the least amount of stress that we can have on there, the higher that that bowl load we can we can actually manage. So you know. At this time, it's always the time of the year when you know a lot of squares and flowers get pushed out the bottom of tar drains and into into irrigation ditches and, and pumps as well. And there's always that thing, oh, we're, we're losing a lot of fruit. But you know that, that's a natural occurrence. It's just a matter of managing that stress through that time that we can actually keep as many of those bowls as we possibly can, not um, unintentionally knock them off by having the plant go through a little bit of stress. The other implication of uh, different stresses th throughout the season is the, um, the impacts on um, fibre quality. And uh, here's some more work from Steve Yates um, looking at the impact of uh, stress after cutout. Um, principally, the, the major major impact on um, stresses like water stress will occur early in flowering development because that's those flowers um, are actually, well, when, when fibres lengthen, it's actually early in bowl development, so there is more for, um, bowls there early in flowering um, exposed to early stresses, and that's why we see differences in length at that time. Um, you can see here in this graph, and in Steve's work, he actually showed that there was probably very little impact on, on fibre length um, post cutout. Um, that's because most of those bowls have already experienced um, the have actually grown their fibres because that occurs early in bowl development. Why we see impacts, where we do see impacts um, later in growth is on both micronair and strength. Strength is often associated with micronair um, because of the, the laying, laying down of cellulose, um, but that's what basically principally where we're impacting on photosynthesis post cutout is where we see differences in micronair, which is essentially the amount of um, cellulose laid down. We'll probably move on now a little bit so the important part about, about that though is the micronair sort of thing is if we're going to be pushing, we're, we're a, bit, a little bit late this season, um, maturity of the crop, um, just due to the, the cool start, we're going to be pushing some of these crops later into the autumn than we probably would like. So that's going to be more of a tendency to go to a lower micronair in developing those late bolts. We've also got a fairly high percentage of our fruit in that later portion of the crop. So you know, we really want to make sure that if we are managing this last irrigation that we do make sure that we try and hit the right on the, on the 
on the money because, yeah, especially if we get into the cooler regions where you know micron air is or low micron air is, a, is an issue, we want to make sure that we, we finish these crops off really well because you know that is a fairly important consideration. Yeah, that's a good point, James. And probably the other element to that, if we are on erring or lower micron air, is um, ensuring that we have timely defoliation um, in the sense that any. Um, we don't want to be too late with defoliation, but we certainly, and in the case when we're tracking on a lower micron air scenario, we do definitely do not want to be uh, maturing, uh, maturing our fruit or um, defoliating and opening those bowls um, too early because they will be on a lower micron air trajectory. So I'll pass back to, excuse me, James, who will start talking about some of the management implications of a season like this. Okay, so what, what I've put up on the screen there now is um, just the average, what I call um, nodes above white flower de decline from the, the CSD trial program for the five seasons leading up to 2015. And you know, I use this uh, graph basically when I'm out looking at, at the different trial sites just to see where the crops are up to and how they're, they're, they're tracking in terms of um, the yield potential. Obviously, the crops, the lo I like to think, the ones that are above the line uh, are doing pretty well. The ones below the line here, we need to to look at trying to do something. But the other important thing that I wanted to mention here is if you just try and extrapolate across that graph from the four nodes above white flower, you probably get to around about that 1500 day degrees um, situation. Really we want to try and um, be pushing it out as for as long as we possibly can within seasonal constraint, constraints. Obviously you know, there's, there's areas within the industry that you know, have a don't have the luxury that we do have in some of the more hotter regions to, to push a crop into that autumn period. But you know, I'm looking for around about that 40 to 50 days of flowering. Um, but if, if we could stretch it out to around about that 750 day degrees, that would mean we get open cotton um, at cutout. And you know that that is a pretty good indication that the crop is yielding extremely well. So if we can, you know, we can get a crack bowl before the crop cuts out, that's ideal. Um, this season, uh, we just want to be trying to maximise the amount of fruit we we're setting because those early bowls or, or what would have been our early bowls this season um, were lost um, quite quite early on. So James, the question often posed to me is about what, what, what do you do if you're tracking above or below the line and uh, I suppose if, let's maybe firstly deal with you know what if what if you're tracking below the line? Well the, the clear thing to me is that um, notes above white flower is definitely a pseudo measurement for plant stress. So the plant's obviously in stress at some um, way or another. Importantly we need to highlight what that stress is and, and rectify it. Mainly it's to do with um, water um, that we may have been loaded on a couple of irrigations and it's um, the white flowers shut up the plant a little bit in, in that regard. Um, compaction's a, a very, very key thing in that where um, you'll see that the, the wheel track um, rows over the different nodes above white flower count and the ones out in the guest row sort of situation. So, you know, their access to water there, the things we can do there is to just try and give the, the crop a little bit of a hurry up. You know, the irrigation interval may come in a little, little bit tighter. There may be a, 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 an ability to, to run some nitrogen um, just to give it a little bit of a, a hurry up. Um, but, you know, really it's just saying that the plant's in stress. We don't, you know, one of the things that we, we like to see and we always promote, they have as many nodes above white flower as nodes above white flower flowering as we possibly can to act as a buffer because it's easier to, to rectify a crop in that seven to eight nodes above white flower than it is in that four to five nodes above white flower. Um, you know, there is crops out there that have sat at five nodes above white flower all the way through flowering, but they're a very stressful crop. Um, so it's more about having a resilience within the plant to, to, to handle a little bit of stress and then be able to recover from it. For those above the line, um, what normally happens there is we're sitting pretty, but you know it's a matter of okay working out what is it because the crop's growing really really well, or well, there are other implications there. So is it because there is no fruit down below and there's nothing holding the crop back, so it's it's bouncing. You know? So it's more about management there of making sure that we've got a good bowl load for that certain period of time, looking at the vegetative growth rate to make sure that we're not getting a crop that's starting to shoot and. Um, you know, going to grow rank as well. So, you know, in both scenarios, it doesn't mean that we're, we're sitting pretty. It's just a matter of making sure that we understand what we need to monitor at those two, two different things to make sure that we do um, that optimise our yield. And often an important implication is as, you, as you're tracking towards that, that date of last effective flower is that um, 
if, if you are tracking well above that line that you may have to start to implement management practices that help bring that line down fairly rapidly to ensure that you get appropriate maturity and uh, not too much rank growth. So, um, can, you know, that, that really stems around, you know, appropriate strategies in terms of using things like cutout rates of picks um, or even considering um, potentially you know, um, the opposite of what James was saying, if you, you go fall back to a normal irrigation regime rather than actually trying to hurry it along. So um, that's, that, that, that there's certainly strategies to consider. Yeah, just obviously if you're sitting above the line, you're, you're sitting a little bit prettier than you are below the line. Um, but yeah, it's quite easy to, to shut a crop down. It's just hard to, to start one up. So yeah, we'd, we'd rather be above the line. And you're right, you know, we, we need to make sure that we understand that there is a point in the season when there could be a chance that, that bowl is not going to mature and get into the picker. And that's the whole aim of the game. So. We need to understand that, and I think you're going to talk a little bit about the last effective flower and the time we're there. But you know, there there is a time of the season where if you keep on chasing extra flowers, extra flowers, they're not going to mature. You're going to waste a lot of energy and a lot of resources filling stuff that's not actually going to mature and actually going to impact on fibre quality as well. So now we're going to talk a little bit about irrigation management after cutout um, and tracking and how you actually deal with that and I suppose the implications of that and James mentioned about you know the, the problems when you actually tend to uh, uh, over irrigate um, approaching in the season. Um, James mentioned about, James, um, mentioned about the, the problems we often have associated with compaction um, and uh, also if we have too much water left in the profile if we've got adequate nutrition trying to shut those crops down can be are extremely difficult. So one of the techniques that's often been promoted is that you know we do have um, sort of estimates of of um, appropriate sort of uh, refill points uh, at the end of the season, and it's it's a simple matter of it. You can actually generally you can actually look to actually uh, go a little bit below. Um, so if you if you are irrigating on a 70 mil um, deficit, you may look to go a little harder, say to a 90 mil deficit. And as we've seen, that the impact on yield is can the chances of impacting on yield are going to be much less um, as you approach the end of the season. So you can work that crop a little bit harder, but it is it is challenging. The, the other thing is that you we don't want to actually be stressing this crop at the very end. So the intent is to actually uh, empty the profile as if you are almost going to irrigate again at the end of the season but actually not to overstress the crop because the implications of stressing the crop too much is because defoliation and uh, bowl opening is actually an active living process using um, plant hormones. Is if the plant is actually dying or stressed, the, the effectiveness of those hormones actually gets um, pretty poor. So the intent is um, to actually get an estimate of when, how long you are till the defoliation, estimate your water use, and we can go to the web and get estimates of uh, crop ET um, and forecast for those sort of things, and actually start to calculate, you know, how many whether you should be irrigating or not in terms of uh, meeting that um, final profile outcome. So I'll hand <coughs> I'll hand it back to James. Well, sorry, where are we, James? Are we uh, talking about the number of days? Okay, how we determine number of days of foliation? So basically, it's all about maths from now on. You know, we're forecasting when we think that we'll be defoliating and trying to work that out on our um, on the plant or the average or predominant number of plants. So the last effective flower, and Mike's going to give a rundown about that, um, is is the last flower. So it's the one that we probably tag and say, okay, well this is the last one we're going to make, and we can count back and you know the n number of nodes. So if there's you know 16 nodes or 15 nodes. Um, three days a node to make the math, or four days a node to make the math really easy at 60 days sort of situation and that's our, 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 our um, defoliation date. You know, it becomes a lot easier once the bowls start to open um, because the math gets a little bit easier too. But you know, one thing that I will stress this season is that we probably need to be using multiple methods of determining this because the plant's not growing the way we, we normally expect. We've got tipped out plants, we've got plants that you know, have got maybe two predominant stems, a lot of vegetative fruit um, and that sort of stuff. So what we want to be trying to do is, okay, well let's work out firstly when we think our last effective flower is and that's the, what the last flower we think we're going to mature to full maturity and be able to pick it um, without you know too much too much hassle. We don't want to have those 
bowls that we had to force open, that are going to have low micro near, low strength, probably you know have fibre quality issues as well. That that'll impact on the uniformity of the sample and the and the like. So we want to make sure that we finish these crops off well, that we are you know, presenting a, a high quality product. Um, tagging those tagging those flowers is an awful often a useful way to get a feel for whether you those flowers are maturing or not, and you can reset your defoliation decision a little bit about how those flowers are maturing. Those particular ones you tagged uh, are presenting themselves at harvest. Yeah, that's um, it's just a way of you know making sure that you go back to the same spot. Um, I think that you know, the, the amount of variability across fields, um, which we've, we've really started to look at lately, is, is something that we you know, we need to have a handle on and just going back to those same bowls or flowers then bowls all the way through the season is a, is a, is a, is a thing that we, we need to do. So you know, the methods that we want to look at, you know, so depending on your region, it's normally going to be about three to four days per node um, in, in development. Um, 42 day degrees if you want to get really scientific about it but working out that basically you know the last effective flower is this one here from the bottom bowl or the one that you know count up the number of nodes times that by three or four depending on how you're going um, the work out the number of days we'll get to a graph in a, in a moment I'll talk about the amount of water use per day remember that at this stage, we are pumping a lot of water through the plant, especially you know in, in this heat. But it will decline as we go further and further into the season. So yeah, we are at maximum water use at the moment. But as we crop starts to open up, water use starts to wane off as well. And it's just a matter of thinking about you know that section throughout the, the whole time. So, you know, from from now on, we're looking at two months away from defoliation sort of situation. We're not really thinking about that. Um, but the what we want to make sure is that we, we do know that you know, we have got three irrigations and then we'll be looking at our last irrigation and trying to, to work that around because um, there is a way to massage that um, to make sure that we do try and get a full irrigation because there's nothing worse than getting stuck halfway through and, and being in that no man's land which makes it a real hard decision. James, you, you raised a really important question, um, point about this season with the tipping out and the, the potential lack of uniformity in crops when it comes to using those above a crack bowl. Um, I think and that's why I jumped forward to the slide and I want to make a point. So that certainly we, we found nose above crack bowl is a, an effective means of tracking uh, your your speed as you approach defoliation and helping to estimate this thing. I think the point that I really wanted to make here is as we approach defoliation um, in making decisions about whether to defoliate or not in terms of the amount of immature and mature bowls present on the plant, it would be uh, wise in certainly a crop that's tipped out a fair bit or not uniform to actually fall back to some of the methods like uh, using the bowl cutting technique um, um, to actually determine whether you have mature, mature or immature bowls. So yes, very much the nose above crack bowl in a, in a, in a normal season but as you approach defoliation, fall back to some of those other techniques. And a, a rule of thumb, or well actually it's not more than a rule of thumb based on the research that we've done, is that if you're actually, um, you have 29% uh, or less immature bowls on a, on a per square metre basis, you're relatively safe in terms of impacts on yield and, in, yield and quality. So I often use a mixture of both nose above crack bowl and bowl cutting to actually ensure that I've, I've appropriately reached defoliation. So I'll just jump back now, talk a little bit about um, the last flower tool. Um, this is something that's purely just a, a simple tool that we, we have on the Codicis website that uh, uses um, established and known uh, physiology or phenology, um, crop development around the bowl periods that we have for, for crops. Um, we basically, you can, you can do one of two things, you can enter you can use the, the date of first frost as a, an indicator of when cold temperatures are, are really occurring. And the, the tool basically on using historical data back calculates a bowl period um, based on a, you know, a period from your last effective flower to your last effective bowl. bowl. And then you can, can also use it to take it back to your last effective um, square in that sense. But the, the interesting thing is that um, as a tool, um, it certainly can define, you know, when you, your last effective square and last effective flower is in terms of, you know, your management um, based on historical data. Um, one question that I certainly often get lately is how relevant is this tool um, to, you know, current varieties 
and that. And um, the fascinating thing is that we've just done a reanalysis re for much of uh, bowl periods for current varieties and compared it back to Greg Constable's data which was used to develop this tool many years ago and we found that the bowl periods haven't changed at all. So I'm very confident that you know if you're actually choosing to use this tool to, to get an estimate of the last effective flower, whether you enter your own date of last effective bowl or, or defoliation date or, or using um, frost, it's going to give you still give you a very strong indication of, of, of the season length that you need to, to mature those bowls. So moving on, <coughs> um, I think now James is going to talk a little bit about you know the water use in, in this period. So as you can see from this graph, we're, we're around about that 120 day sort of end of January, February sort of mark now. We're out of the, the peak water use. Um, you know, for some of these crops in this heat, you know, we're, we're using you know it says eight or just above eight mils a day there here, but we're using up around about 12 to 13 mils a day at at, at this time. But you can see as the season pro progresses along and we start to get that open bowl there, that the crop does actually um, wane off in terms of its, its crop water use and. You know, we can utilise that to make sure that we are um, stretching those irrigations to um, man manage the crop and you know manage manage the crop's growth as well as make sure we, we, we get that fibre uh, good fibre quality. So you know it's a matter of now of saying, okay, well where where are we up to? Where do we think we're going to be um, defoliating? And then just trying to associate different um, crop water uses. Obviously, that's going to change as we actually get the the, the weather. We do get rainfalls. Uh, a fairly big impact on a, a lot of these things as well. But as you can see from this, yes, yep, water use is quite high at the moment. But you know, as we tail off to the end of the season, it does come back down, and we'll probably end up around about using four mils a day um, in that week before we we actually divide out the crop. So James, really, this is the the ultimate question is really time asking the question about whether we put that last irrigation on or not is often one of the most challenging questions of, through the whole season. And uh, you might want to talk about some of your rules of thumb of delivering that. Right. So, as I said, it comes back down to maths all the time. So, basically, four nodes above crack bowl, that's our defoliation date. So, it's a matter of working out yeah, from there. So, if we we look for that first open bowl, and we count up a number of nodes to our last effective flower in, in that regard. So, you know, I'm going to do it nice and easy. So, say it's 10 nodes. So, I, I can do all the math in my head. But, Ten nodes, or oh no, sorry, it's fourteen nodes. Um, just to make it minus four from that gives us ten nodes. If we are going at um, four uh, days per note, forty days sort of situation. At this stage, um, you, know, you you probably look at say well, we're using eight mils a day, um, probably coming back down to, to six and to four. So say we have an average of of, of six mils. There's two hundred and forty mils of water that we need to apply to that crop. Yeah. Yeah, so it's at least two irrigations sort of situation. The, what we do then is we say, okay, well when are they going to be? And what we want to try and do is, you know, that last irrigation, there is a bit of a buffer area there at that last irrigation that we can go past that refill point. And really in this day and age too with the, the new um, pickers and, and the weight and the footprint that they leave, I would be thinking that I would be trying to err on the, the side of caution in terms of making sure that soil profile was very, very all dry. Dry, because um, you know Michael Brunark, um, who's done a lot of work on this, you know, if the f top meter's dry, he's actually seeing the weight of the picker push that soil down and actually compact the, the moist soil underneath it, underneath that dry layer there. So you know, we've really got to make sure that we manage that a lot, lot better. So you know, if what we don't want to do is get you know to the second last irrigation and it being like a, an irrigation and a half away sort of situation. We've got to make sure that we, we try and manage that so that we do get to the stage where you know if we are on say a ten day sort of uh, situation with that water, um, that twelve day, thirteen day, yeah, we can stretch it out to that. But if it gets you know to that um, that hazy zone, that that's where we don't want to be. So it's, it's just about making sure that we work out the math and just continually updating that as we move along and, and things change. Rainfall obviously comes in, we, we, we have to readjust that sort of stuff and you know how it works across the whole farm. But um, the final irrigation, yes, it's important to finish that crop off, but if we um, we don't want to have a situation where we are picking with soil because that is going to um, 
give us problems for years and years and years into the future. Uh, you certainly would support that, James, and I think just your point about that you can probably push a little further beyond your normal irrigation refill point. Um, and because certainly in the case of effective defoliation, you don't actually need to have, you need the plants to be alive um, and not overly stressed, but they can certainly go a little bit further beyond what we what we what we're using to actually optimise uh, plant growth from time to time. Just just a mention of some of the re you know there is still remains of a uh, considerable focus on research um, around that timing of last irrigation where we're looking to to um, bring together our knowledge of uh, soil water use, um, soil water and compaction, uh, together with our knowledge of uh, plant-based sensing technologies to actually have a real good indication of when, when we really do, when we should in, in, um, irrigate and if we don't irrigate, what are the implications on, on yield per se. I think just we're, we're sort of coming to the close a little bit, but just, you know, to talk about, we're jumping to the end of the season about the um, implications of incorrect defoliation timing and uh, I think that's you know if we, we do go and we, we mentioned that previously about you know certainly this season as James has mentioned that we are in a delayed scenario that if we uh, if we do look to go too early with defoliation it does certainly leaves us open to potentially impacting on yield um, uh, impacting on yield and impacting on quality and I mentioned about if you do defoliate what we found our, our our sort of research says if you've got any more than 29%, or I don't know why I actually made 29%, it should be 30, round off the 30%, 30% or more immature bowls, you are, and you defoliate with those immature bowls, you will impact yield and quality. And by going too early, you, you reduce micronair, and if you're already on a, 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 a lower plane of micronair in the first place, it could put you into potential uh, discount ranges. Um, but the other thing that goes, and it's important in the Australian industry, is the implications on what we call NEPs. So NEPs are formed when you mechanically processing the fibre, immature fibres get twists and they form little tufts, and that, that, those little tufts sort of, you know, get thrown, get through, go through the whole processing system and can uh, significantly impact the uh, fibre quality uh, reputation of an industry in terms of fibre quality. On the other hand, if you were to go too late with your um, defoliation, the risks that you're sort of leading to there are one, that you are uh, allowing things like regrowth um, and um, trash levels to, to increase, but then there's also the, the balance that you're trying to, to judge in terms of trying to avoid um, discounts associated with weather. I think that, James, I think we're pretty well um, on here. Back to you, mate. No, no, I just uh, wouldn't have made a comment about your 30% maturity sort of thing so um, and it's not, not nothing to do with that it's more about saying well you know what's our target in terms of bowl numbers and that's we have worked on around about 150 being you know that 12.5 bowl sort of range um, obviously bowl weight has a, a big impact on that um, and that changes from region to region and where the majority of the bowls are set so but um, in this past two seasons we've had to actually readjust our um, targets to being around about that 170. So, you know, we're, we're looking at, um, you know, a 30% of 150, that's, you know, 45, 45, 45, 45, so fair few bowls per metre um, that we need to make sure that we are. Um, so, you know, if we do have 150 bowls a metre and 45 of them aren't open, that's a, a thing that we need to look out for this season. Because um, the, the, the normal plant that we've been, you know, used to for the last, you know, 20 odd years now um, is not what we're seeing this year. Just, just a slight refinement on that, James, was not open but mature. That's why, um, so they're immature bowls, ones that actually haven't got the hard seed coat, um, so the brown seed coat um, and, you know, are still mushy bowls and, and um, so as soon as you get bowls that are got the hard seed coat, I'm oh, sorry, the brown seed coat, difficult to cut, you know, stringy. Um, you know, I define them as mature. So it's it's 45, in the, in the case of James' scenario of 150 bowls, it's 45 or more that are, any more than 45 immature ones that are really, that don't have those properties, um, puts at risk. So Matt, is there anything else that you want to um, add? The only other thing that I'd probably add there might, is, that, you know, it comes back to that 45 bowls, is that bowls mature differently at different rates through the season. So, you know, when it's nice and hot now, they're pretty much 
going at full total. It's, as we're pushing later into the season into autumn, there's going to be a, um, a, a slowdown in the actual development of those, those, those bowls. So, um, and we, we've been doing some stuff, and it's been interesting watching some of the stuff that Jory Emilio has been pulling out from the Southern Valleys about, you know, bowls that are set now compared to bowls that are set in two weeks' time, and the differences in the maturity of those bowls is something like 20-odd days, which is um, quite significant. So we just, uh, I just pulled up the last effective flower tool where we've just you know, looked at the scenario of adding if you were to um, delay your determination of last effective flower in, in what is for Maury, you uh, go from 64 to 74 days, you know, two weeks. Uh, you add three weeks and you're at 83 days. And, it, and certainly if you do that for Griffiths or some other areas, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, quite, it's a quite uh, amazing extension of it. And I, I, I always remember the um, thing that Greg Constable showed me once where we took some bowls late in the season, you know, in this scenario, and we still had them sitting on our bookshelf, you know, six months later unopened. So it just um, really does affect them. the temperature. And this simulator really does affect, you know, when you get in those cool conditions, affects the maturity. Which is why we're probably stressing this last effective flower or, or that, you know, to make sure that we are, um, especially this season when we're a little bit later, just to make sure that we, we can stop them. It's just a matter of, you know, your, your risk profile in terms of how, what you think this, the autumn or the picking period is going to be like, but, you know, there's nothing worse than sitting there trying to wait or, or trying to bust bowls open. So we're going to hand back to Janelle. Thanks, Mike and James. Um, we'll just open it up to questions now. And if you have a question, you can type those into the chat box. And while we're doing that, I'll just go through some resources that are available. Um, obviously, through Cotton Info, there's a blog which covers some of the information covered there today. It was on the newsletter that went out last Monday. Um, CSD have a number of facts on um, Friday that are available through those websites. Um, there's also a number of videos through Cotton Info, so hop onto the Cotton Info YouTube channel and have a look at, um, at those as well. 